Hello, everyone. Buju Nijiwag, Nimin Wain Damayawa no Manungum, Ginu Joginakwe, Nindijna Kaz, and Nishnabe Mung, Idash Katrina Phillips, Nindijna Kaz, Jaganash Mung, Makwa Nindo Dem, Minawa, Wikuyang, and Mindige Biagaz, Miguech Bizindawe Nungum. Hello, my friends. I'm glad to be here today. Tall Chief Woman is what I am known as in Ojibwe, and Katrina Phillips is my English name. I am from the Bear Clan, and I'm enrolled at Redcliffe. Thank you for listening to me today. I want to thank all of you for joining us today, and I want to thank everyone at the Minnesota Historical Society for helping make this series a reality, whether it's coordinating and planning each session or working behind the scenes this afternoon. So before we begin, I want to acknowledge that even though this is a virtual event, the Minnesota History Center is located on the traditional territory of many nations and on the ancestral lands of Dakota people who will continue to call this region home. Minnesota is centered within Dakota creation stories and is an important place in traditional Ojibwe history and the history of other native nations. We pay our respects to the indigenous ancestors of this place. This is the first event in an ongoing series called Shared Spaces and Public Places. The Minnesota Historical Society is committed to engaging the public on the role of monuments and memorials and what they say and don't say about our shared history. MNHS is offering a slate of related programs as the Capital Area Architectural and Planning Board, also known as the CAP Board, continues to seek public input on the process for contextualizing, adding and removing monuments and artwork displayed on the Minnesota State Capitol grounds. Shared Spaces and Public Places is a free four-part discussion series offered and archived on the MNHS Facebook and YouTube pages once each month, July through October. As the moderator for this series, I will be joined each month by scholars, artists, and community members for a discussion about local as well as national issues. I am an enrolled citizen of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe. I'm currently an assistant professor of history at McAllister College in St. Paul, where I teach courses in American Indian history and the history of the American West. My first book, Staging Indigeneity, Salvage Tourism and the Performance of Native American History, is scheduled to come out of the University of North Carolina Press next spring. And my next project looks at environmentalism, activism, and tourism on and around Red Cliff. It feels a little weird to be introducing myself, so I'll keep it short. I earned my BA and my PhD from the University of Minnesota. I was a Consortium for Faculty Diversity Fellow at McAllister before I joined the faculty, and I'm also a Woodrow Wilson Fellow. I was born and raised in northern Wisconsin, and my husband and I live in the Twin Cities with our two sons. Joining me today are Dr. Kate Bean and Dr. Gabriella Spears Rico. Dr. Kate Bean is a citizen of the Flandreau Santi Dakota Oyate in South Dakota, but as a Dakota person, her family is rooted and from Minnesota. Her people come from Black Dogs Village, which was located in what is now more widely known today as Egan in Minnesota, and at Hayato Otunwe, where Bede Makasta is today in South Minneapolis. Dr. Bean is a public historian director of Native American Initiatives at the Minnesota Historical Society and teaches Dakota history at Minneapolis College. Dr. Bean was a Charles A. Eastman pre-doctoral fellow at Dartmouth College and also served as a president's postdoctoral fellow at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She is an urban board member of the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council and serves on the boards for the Native Governance Center and for the Lower Phelan Creek Project. She was also recently appointed to the Capital Area Architectural and Planning Board by Governor Waltz. Today, she is proud to live and work back in her homelands of the Twin Cities with her partner and two daughters. Dr. Gabriela Spears Rico is a Perinda Purapecha Indigenous Scholar from the community of Chato, who currently serves as an Assistant Professor of Chicano Latino Studies and American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Spears Rico is working on her first book, Mestizo Melancholia and the Legacy of Conquest in Michoacan. Her research explores representations of indigeneity in Mexican popular culture. Through anthropological methods, she queries how cultural appropriation has historically manufactured the production of mestizaje. She authored In Gratitude of All Yelitsa Gives Us Within the Limits of Roma for the Indian Collective, 
and in the time of war and hashtags, rehumanizing indigeneity in the digital landscape in indigenous interfaces, which was published last year by the University of Arizona Press. She is a Mellon Mays Fellow and a Woodrow Wilson Fellow and currently serves as the chair of the Women's Indigenous and Native Caucus for Mujeres Activas in Letras y Cambio Social, MALCS. She mothers a fierce Ojibwe Dakota Pirinda Chicanita named Miskekwe and lives in St. Paul. And so we'll start off with some background information and then we'll move into a moderated discussion with our panelists. We'll end with a question and answer period, so you are welcome to add questions throughout the presentation. Staff are monitoring the chat and will aggregate questions for the panel as time allows. I referenced the CAP board at the beginning of this session, and this series will provide an entry point for conversation around these important topics. We'll be looking at local events while also framing them in a national context, particularly in light of the recent national recognition reckoning with racism. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kate Bean as director of Native American Initiatives at MNHS. And she's going to tell us a little bit, a little bit about the work the CAP board is looking at surrounding these issues. Miigwech, Dr. Phillips. Um, Kate Bean So I am director of Native American Initiatives at the Minnesota Historical Society. And the Minnesota Historical Study knows that there are many viewpoints on these issues. This institution is really looking forward to a robust and respectful conversation through these four schedule programs and beyond, because this, is, this work is going to go beyond four schedule programs. Um, these topics and this programming is just part of a larger um, sort of initiative and, and part of a larger um, uh, amount of work that's going to be coming out of the Minnesota Historical Society over the coming months to help educate the public and to inspire more conversation. As previously stated, I'm one of the newest members of the CAP board. I was recently appointed by the governor. The first CAP board meeting that I attended was actually held virtually last month. This meeting focused on clarifying the existing statutory responsibilities for the CAP board in order to provide a shared understanding of jurisdictional authority moving forward between the CAP board and the Minnesota Historical Society. So pretty, pretty bureaucratic. Um, the future meetings of the CAP board are gonna help clarify and further establish a process by which artwork displayed on the Capitol grounds might be evaluated for potential alteration, reinterpretation, relocation, and possibly removal. The decision making authority for these possible changes lies with the CAP board um, but the implementation of some of that action, in particular around some of the, um, the artworks, um, are a shared responsibility with the Minnesota Historical Society. So with MNHS working in partnership with the CAP Board, um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work forward on, on um, determining what happens with some of these pieces in the future. This is work that many people in diverse communities across the state have been requesting for quite some time. And I'm really proud and excited to serve and work with my fellow CAP colleagues and with the Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan, who chairs our board. Um, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan recently, she stated that we're in a moment when we need to have real conversations about the symbols and imagery that continue to exist in these public spaces, such as at the Capitol. And the fact is that as a society and as a state, we need to have an honest dialogue about how this state's narrative has been constructed, and we need to include, include those who historically have been excluded from participating in that state narrative. Now, historically, certain voices of diverse communities were not at the table when decisions about representation and interpretation in our state's more public spaces have been made. And today we're seeing some of those faces change. We're seeing some difference. We're seeing that the faces of those at the table are now changing to be more inclusive. Um, and, and, you know, I think we're all sort of um, wondering, so what does this mean? Uh, it's, our it's our job at the CAP board as well as at the Minnesota Historical Society to work together to help create and support spaces for these topics to be discussed, to inspire education, learning, conversation. And there is clearly a need for more public, a more accessible and a more transparent process when it comes to determining who is respectfully represented at our state's capital which is a place that we all deserve to feel more welcome. Thank you, Dr. Bean. And 
So now we're going to move into our moderated discussion. And so we've had the opportunity to talk, you know, the three of us have had some conversations leading up to this, and we're just really excited to be able to kind of share our thoughts and the things we're kind of looking at both historically as well as in terms of this contemporary moment. And as a historian, I kind of want to take a minute to situate ourselves. And Minnesota has an incredible indigenous history, but we kind of lose that narrative by the time we get to around the mid 20th century. But Minnesota and the Twin Cities specifically plays a really large role in this mid-century resurgence of indigenous activism and advocacy. And for instance, the American Indian Movement, also known as AIM, was founded in Minneapolis in 1968. And native communities continue to advocate around issues that affect native and indigenous communities, as well as other underrepresented populations. And so the first question I kind of want to pose for our conversation here to Dr. Bean and Dr. Spears Rico, how do you see what's happening here in Minnesota in more of this broader national context? Well, I can, I can say as someone who has taught Dakota language immersion in preschool, has taught at the college level in American Indian studies and in Dakota history more specifically, um, I know that many people in our communities feel that a more inclusive and nuanced history has not only not been taught to them, but in some ways has been purposely kept from them. Um, you know, Dakota history is Minnesota history. Our stories and our connection to this land go back to the beginning of this place. Um, these borders are not our borders. Um, we come from much more than just a state of Minnesota. This is, this is our regional territory, but our people live within and outside of these borders today. We're still here um, and we have many contributions to help, to help contribute um, to the narrative of this place and to knowledge about the history and the meaning of this place. And so we're here to help each other understand this place that we all call home. And, you know, I live, um, more specifically, I live in an area of Minneapolis that saw a lot of social unrest following the murder of George Floyd. Um, the murder of George Floyd actually happened across the street from where my children went to preschool. And my husband was out on patrol with others helping to keep, keep our community safe. Um, alongside others in the community, such as AIM Patrol and other neighborhood community members. And we're living in a really historic time. We're living in the moment right now. And I think we can all sense that. And it's, it's an empowering feeling. Sometimes it's a scary feeling, um, but it's an important time. And our children are watching, they're noticing this. You know, it's a continuation of the Red Power Movement of the 60s and 70s. Um, and this movement has some distinct roots in Minneapolis, as you said, with AIM Patrol, which began as a response to police brutality. In many ways, our communities are still struggling with some of the same issues that our parents and our grandparents faced, but we're also in a different health, in a different place to support actions of change. Um, and and we, we are in different spaces um, advocating and, and having a voice. And so it's time to talk and it's time to listen. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, greetings and thank you so much for inviting me to be part of the conversation today. I'm very honored um, to be here with um, these two brilliant uh, Native women scholars um, and historians that I deeply admire. I'm an Indigenous migrant, um, as Dr. Phillips introduced me. I come from um, on my mother's side from the community of Atapaneo, Michoacán, which is in Ejido, and on my father's side from the community of Charo, which is a Pirinda community. And um, <clears throat> so I belong to two different ethnic groups in Michoacán. Um, the Pirinda people were a smaller um, ethnic group that was a migrating tribe. Um, we have an establishment in Michoacán thanks to territory that was granted to us by the Purépecha people. So we have a, a direct kinship and territorial relationship with them and really being under, under their protection um, that dates back centuries now within the state. Um, and then also um, on my mother's side, as I was, I was, I was stating um, um, the, through uh, Purepecha, um, Purepecha lineage. And this is in uh, West Central Mexico. 
I came to the United States um, with, with my mother when um, I was four years old across the Otay Mountains um, of the U.S.-Mexico border along, along um, where Tijuana meets San Diego um, with, my, with my mother when she was pregnant. <clears throat> and um, she was pregnant with my baby sister, Suhey. And then my mother raised, um, raised us as a single mother. And, um, you know, through, those, through that migration and kind of like that um, displacement, um, it was hard for me to maintain, um, you know, what would be, uh, for example, access to traditional knowledge, access to language, et cetera, um, that, um, you know, was uh, left behind in Michoacán, though now I, I do, um, you know, strongly have those tra those transnational ties um, through my um, research and my activist work as well. Um, I grew up in the Santa Maria Valley in California and really have been part of these conversations um, for a while now through um, going to college with, um, with, uh, with California Indian people. Um, um, my peers at, at Stanford, um, who also you know, became um, activists as well as meeting other activists, um, California Indian activists, um, who have been demanding that also that statues that um, honor Spanish conquistadores uh, be, uh, be removed in, in California. Um, and uh, the way that I related um, to those conversations initially, you know, as an indigenous migrant is also through having experienced, you know, um, similar colonization from Spanish conquistadores through my own people, but also realizing that the relationship that California Indians have to those statues is different than mine when it sits on, in, when it sits on, on their land where they wake up every day and experience this very triggering pain with statues of people like, you know, um, Junipero Serra standing and honoring somebody who started the evangelism process, you know, in a very violent, in a very violent history, in a very violent way. So I come to Minnesota um, through love. I fell in love um, with my husband, Chester, who is a member of the Red Lake tribe here, um, you know, and we decided to raise our children here because of, um, like, because of our daughter's um, membership in the Red Lake tribe as well. And because we want her to grow up, you know, close to, to, um, to her Ojibwe language and her Ojibwe people as well. Um, but here in Minnesota, I'm also very aware of, you know, of, of my situatedness as an indigenous migrant. Um, and as an, you know, as an indigenous migrant, I'm always thinking about um, the way that I navigate um, land where I'm, not, I'm an uninvited guest and how I can um, be an ally to the stewardship of native people that are from the, or that are from these particular lands. And, um, and I come to the, to, you know, situating myself at the table as a mother, as an artist, as a community member, um, and as an educator who works in American Indian studies, um, you know, as well here at the University of Minnesota and in Chicano Latino studies, and thinking critically about, you know, many of those, those how all of that is, all of that is interwoven for me in terms of how I relate to these monuments here in Minnesota, as well as, you know, as I was, as I was saying, mothering um, an indigenous child from Minnesota and, um, you know, thinking through all of those connections and the interventions that I myself want to make with my um, role as a professor and as an activist and as an artist. Well, and it's, it's just really fascinating listening to the two of you talk and, you know, we, we only have an hour, but I feel like we could kind of keep this conversation going for a lot longer than that. And it's, it's just really fascinating to kind of step back and take a look at the indigenous history of not only this place, but also any place, you know, I'm sure we have people joining us who are not in Minnesota right now, who might be, you know, somewhere else within the United States who might be in another country altogether. And to recognize not only what this history looks like, but also what it means and who has, I guess, in a sense, become the central character or who have become the central characters in the histories that we tell. And one thing that we've kind of been thinking about here, we've got some really kind of bigger ideas that we're talking about, particularly around the idea of memory and memorialization and monuments. And in their 2019 book, Monumental Mobility, the memory work of Massasoit, two scholars in Native American and Indigenous Studies, Dr. Lisa Blee and Dr. Jean O'Brien, write that, quote, monuments are erected in the hopes of fixing existing memories about the past so that the individual group or event commemorated is not forgotten, end quote. And if we're thinking about memory and memorialization, you know, we're 
we've mentioned, um, you know, kind of the Columbus statue and then also Dr. Spears Rico with what you're saying as far as the Sarah statues, right? And the idea of what it means to be indigenous to a place or to recognize the indigenous history of a place and to see monuments and statues and memorializations of these really large figures that kind of loom over these histories. And if we're thinking about memory and memorialization, there's a sense of urgency in a way around collective memory and wanting to make sure that one is kind of afforded a place in history. And so how do you think about and contextualize these notions of monuments and memory? You know, I find it interesting to think about um, some of the cultural differences in some of this stuff. You know, in my my communities, we have a lot of horseback rides and runs and and a lot of sort of active ways in which we come together and talk about history, learn about history. And we also relate, you know, in, in doing a lot of these these memorial um, rides and runs and, and walks, we um, relate the history to the present. And we acknowledge the ways in which that history has impacted us. And we think about the ways in which the history, that history, history is going to impact future generations. Um, and when I look at statues, I always wonder, you know, were they really meant to last forever? Oftentimes the materials are created, um, they, you know, there's costs that, that go into maintaining them, um, especially in our harsh winters in Minnesota, you know, and what does that mean? Were they, you know, are these things really fixated? Are they really supposed to be here forever? And we have to think about space. We have to think about how are we allowing um, for space for future generations to make their mark too? Um, that's something that came up recently at a cap board meeting when, when we were really looking at the spaces around the Capitol and the fact that we're going to run out of space. Um, what does that mean? You know, and I think that it's incredibly important to think about how do we, um, you know, who, who gets acknowledged, who gets represented, who's at the table and making those decisions. But we have to also be able to have some very tough questions some very tough questions. We have to have some tough conversations um, about what these things mean to different people. And we have to acknowledge that there is different meaning for different people. And we have to be able to have some empathy. We have to have be able to have some compassion to think about, um, put ourselves in other people's shoes or, or other people's moccasins and really think about um, what are some of these other perspectives and even intertribal perspectives? You know, it's wonderful to be here with both of you today, um, my indigenous sisters, and to think about how a lot of this, um, these topics and, and this, these ideas of, of memorial, of memory, you know, um, impact our communities in different ways. Our, our culture, our community, our communities are so um, rooted in memory, are so, so rooted in history. Um, we, we have, we still have oral storytelling. We still have traditions that are passed down, um, that keep that history very much alive and very much a part of our culture and of, of rearing our children. Um, it's a part of our everyday life. Um, and it's not fixated on a, uh, material item that is fixated in a space, um, to take, to take up space, you know? And so we really have to think about how we, how we occupy space. Yeah, I want to build on what um, Dr. Bean was talking about how memorials, these memorials and monuments have different meanings for different people. Um, monuments for me um, allow people to mourn, allow people to celebrate and to acknowledge. They function as a public archive, really, for, you know, for the public to um, interact with. Um, they ask us to bear witness to history and in bearing witness um, to history, you know, as we stand, um, uh, as we stand facing these statues, the question becomes, you know, whose history um, and from what um, subject positions are we experiencing them? From what subject positions are we celebrating or mourning them or experiencing this, this public archive? Those of us um, who don't see our own history or our own version of the story reflected in these mon monuments, we also carry memory. We can carry memory in our bodies, from our culture, um, you know, from the way that we experience the world, from the way that our people have experienced history as well. And I think that um, these uh, these moments um, 
you know, when, when racialized minorities, when indigenous populations experience what becomes the official transcript of history through these monuments, we, um, it's an opportunity for, all, for us to also intervene with the counter narrative of what we call in, in ethnic studies, the counter narrative. And, um, and that's what I see happening here um, with, um, with, you know, uh, Dr. Bean did a wonderful job of contextualizing how this, this is, these, this, these moments in Minnesota um, are part of this larger, you know, national conversation around race, ethnicity, monuments, power, and privilege. I think that what happens um, that we don't, that we're not talking about enough with, um, with you know, um, these demands to take down monuments or the actual physical acts of taking down um, Confederate statues and the monuments of colonizers, for example, Spanish colonizers, you know, that recently there's been debate and takedowns of Don Juan de Oñate in New Mexico too, for example, um, is what is revealed, you know, um, and unearthed as they're taken down too. Um, and I think that what is revealed and, and through the act of removal, what's revealed is the history that's always been there. It's the history of folks who um, who experience these statues through trauma and through pain. And um, and that's a history that also needs to be contended with as we talk about, about monuments and as we talk about mem mem memorialization, because those are also valid experiences. They can be very visceral, spiritual, et cetera, experiences um, with these, the, these huge erections these brick and mortar um, you know um, monuments that are that are placed to promote a public archive and um, I also um, wanted to talk well no I, I think that I'll, I'll bring it up in another follow-up question so I'll say that much for now well and it's it's just really incredible to think about you know a couple of things that that each of you has said has really, kind of struck a chord with me, Dr. Bean, when you're saying, you know, if we look at the materials that these statues are made out of, you know, and a lot of times when you see, you know, the how the weather, depending on where you are, how all of this kind of can change and erode a statue and to just kind of see what happens to it over time and how we're, how are we meant to interpret these decades after they've been put up in the first place? And Dr. Spears Rico, you were, you reminded me again that, you know, with the Oñate statue that came down, we can even think about this in a global context. If you think about the Colston statue that came down, if you think about the Roads Must Fall movement in South Africa, that what what we're seeing now is is not necessarily the beginning of all of this, but it's kind of a continuation and a much larger movement toward these conversations about not only what statues and monuments are meant to do, but also who they're for. And we've been seeing a lot of conversations about this around the country, but there have also been questions about... I think it's, it's really interesting to think about the ways to and contextualizing this history um, you know, not only were these monuments put up to to contextualize certain time periods, they're not they're not necessarily about even the people who they're supposed to be about. Um, they really are representing time. They're representing that time period in which they were put up. And which, if you do the research and and learn about these time periods in which a lot of these monuments were constructed, um, a lot of times they were constructed specifically to um, to take attention away from people of color um, and to exclude us. And that's an issue, that's a problem. It, it, it really is. And you know, we're seeing a lot of questions, you know, it almost started in, you know, Dr. Spears Rico, as you mentioned, with these Confederate statues and monuments and things like that. But it's also come home to Minnesota, most notably with, the statue of Christopher Columbus that came down last month. And if we think about statues and monuments as reflecting the perspectives of the people who erected them and also the history of the time period in which they were created, this is a history that's often exclusionary. And the Columbus statue that stood in St. Paul was erected in 1931, which is the same year that Columbus Day was declared an official state holiday. And the statue symbolizes and represents different ideas to different people. 
for Italian Americans in the 1930s, Columbus was a symbol of a new identity because as more recent immigrants, they could use Columbus's image to, in a sense, deflect discrimination that they were facing. But this mythical version of Columbus as this like first American erases that much longer history of indigenous people. And for some people, the statue symbolizes a justification for things like the doctrine of manifest destiny and this history of genocide. I mean, Columbus's landfall had lasting negative effects on entire societies and entire nations. And community petitions have been drafted over the years to replace the statue with, you know, memorials that are chosen by Minnesota's African-American and Native American communities, or perhaps even a memorial to Prince. And so the question that I want to pose to the two of you is how do you see something like this playing a role in historical erasure? You know, I love the irony of history. I love the complications of history. You know, I love being a public historian and 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 being a um, being able to to learn from our past and understand the reasons for things and why places are where they are, um, statues are, memorials are where they are. Um, and you know, if you if 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 people are really interested in about the historical repercussions of historical erasure, ask an indigenous person, ask a native woman. Um, you know, especially thinking about our our women and our grandmothers whose names weren't often recorded in the archives. You know, when I did my dissertation, I had the hardest time finding the names of the women in my family. Um, I had to go out and ask family members. They're, they aren't um, included in rules like the names of men. You know, we experience erasure and it, it, it is something that we are born into, that we are born learning how to survive. And it's part of our resilience. That's part of our DNA. And so in talking about historical erasure, having that conversation and um, asking indigenous women in particular what it's like um, is really imperative. It's really important. I think there's a there's definitely a reckoning happening now. There's a there it's but it's been building for centuries. Um, this wasn't something that came out of nowhere overnight. And I think there's a lot to learn about this time in history. We have to have compassion and empathy for one another. Um, we have to learn about each other's lived experiences and so that we can move forward together. And acknowledgement and action go hand in hand. We have to think how we can work um, together to move beyond good intentions. Um, and we're seeing more of this. We may not all agree on tactics or on what's being said and done, but let's learn why. Let's learn about each other. Let's, let's listen and figure out how we can all do better um, you know, I'd love to see Prince on the Capitol. Uh, from what I've been told, uh, somebody has to be dead, I think, 10 years or something like that, um, as much as, as, you know, but I think that's that's fascinating to think about because also how are we making history related relatable for, for young people? You know, how are we keeping people engaged um, in a lot of um, the teachings of our past, of our shared past? Um, and why are we uh, being so cautious about talking about some of the more difficult moments of our past? You know, we have to be able to have these conversations. They're not easy to have. They're uncomfortable. Um, but we have to lean into that discomfort. Native people, indigenous people, you know, have been uncomfortable for a long time in these spaces. Um, and it's time that we share in that discomfort and it's time that we learn from one another and it's time that we really take a hard look at why public spaces look the way that they do and how can we sh sort of um, contribute to a shift so that these public spaces can heal and so that our people can come together and so that there can be better acknowledgement, but more than just acknowledgement so that we can be included and so, um, you know, again, we just have to be able to have these tough conversations and we have to think about um, how do we include one another and we have to listen. Absolutely. Um, I think for me, thinking about thinking about things, what what drove me to um, to witness and be there, 
when the Columbus statue um, was uh, taken down here in St. Paul um, and on June 10th, I think about my, how my, my role as a mother um, and, um, and how much I worry how this official transcript of the state's history is going to impact my daughter's self-image um, growing up, whether it's her, um, her uh, experiences in public schooling, her experiences with representations of Indians in the media, um, of, um, you know, the way that she'll interact with representations of indigenous people and um, colonizers in public spaces and how all of this is going to impact, you know, her self-esteem as, um, as she's growing up. And I think that, you know, really that's what drove me there besides the fact that the Spears family, which I belong to now through marriage, um, has been, you know, very involved in, um, in, in protests as well through, um, through, through um, First Nations United. And, um, and so I knew that I wanted to be there, you know, to, to witness, to bear witness and to stand in solidarity with um, the American Indian community. I know that this has been a very contentious issue um, with, um, the, with the Twin Cities American Indian community. And, and um, that's what drove me there. Um, I want to elaborate a little bit more on that um, by um, preface, um, you know, what I have to say about being there um, by saying that um, I actually have an Italian last name, Rico, it, it, it's, it's, it's an Italian last name. And my family, we have no idea. It comes from my maternal grand, grandfather, um, who I, I inherited his last name. Um, and, uh, and, and we have no idea how we ended up with this Italian last name. Um, you know, we don't have Italian heritage um, at all, according to my grandparents. And my, when I asked my grandfather, who my, my grandfather was one of the oldest people in the community who was in charge of carrying on Purepa Chantology specifically, he, he um, was a pulquero and a milpero. So he worked, you know, with the land, with harvesting, you know, the three sisters and carrying on those, those ontologies. And when I asked him, you know, because he knew so much, I asked him, well, how, what do you know about this last name? And he said, well, he thinks that it was handed down to us through the encomienda system way back when. And that already tells a story of violence, you know, because in, in the, for encomenderos, um, colonizers who were encomenderos were granted a certain amount of Indians. And then those, and then those, you know, indigenous people were given the same last names as um, as the people who were at the, who owned those encomiendas. And so, you know, just kind of carrying that already, um, when I do interact with Columbus statues, whether it's here or in Mexico, the fact that I can't avoid, you know, um, images and replicas of this man who started these very violent expeditions, started the international trafficking of indigenous women and children um, to places like Spain and Italy where they would be enslaved um, and also impacted, you know, my Pirinda people so much so that we don't have, you know, access to our language. We were considered extinct because our language, you know, is if we have less than 20 speakers left in one of our communities in, in, in Mexico. And so, um, you know, as we, we piece together ourselves as Pirinda people um, through these, you know, pieces of our ontologies, basically, of, of what's left. And it's a very painful, you know, re recollection. And it's a very, very painful, um, you know, experience, then visceral experience to come to terms with um, these statues that remind us of, you know, 1521 in Mexico, the arrival of Hernán Cortés that followed the Columbus expedition. 1530, another expedition that was um, that was sponsored by the Spanish crown with the arrival of Cris Cristóbal de Olí and Francisco. Cortes um, in Michoacán specifically that began, you know, the, the um, colonization of Purepecha people. Um, and though there was resistance and there is resilience in these stories as well, um, I think that, you know, the purpose of these public gatherings, whether we whether they are protests or whether, whether they are, you know, as that day pl uh, plans to take down a statue, um, happen um, for collective grief. They happen to express collective grief and to express collective memory. And the feeling that day, when I arrived at about 5, 12 p.m., the statue was already down. Um, the feeling that day was one of victory. And it really made me cry, you know, um, to hear um, the drums ringing out of, and, and the singers, you know, singing a victory song and, and, and being there with, you know, American Indians who were celebrating, you know, um, something that, you know, they had been asking, you know, for, for decades um, during the, during the quincenten quincentennial. I know there was a lot of movement and conversation around, you know, bringing these um, Columbus statues down because it happened also in Michoacán. Um, indigenous people took down, indigenous women took down a statue of Antonio de Mendoza, who was a, a colonizer during during the quince, 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 ah, 
500 anniversary <laughs> of the landing. Um, you know, and I know that, that there was there was also an activist moment, you know, where, where red paint was splashed here in St. Paul on that particular statue on that day too. So this is all interconnected to me. And I can just tell you that I was very moved, you know, to be there. I was very moved to, to bear witness and I will be able to, circling back to why it matters to, matters to me as a mother, I will be able to share that with my daughter. You know, um, and um, and you know, when I do have to sit down and tell her, she'll ask me one day, why don't we speak between that? And I'll have to tell her, you know, and it'll go back to Columbus as it always does for native and indigenous people. So, you know, I, I absolutely support what Dr. Bean is talking about that this is why these narratives matter. I think it's so powerful that you were there on that day and that you can share that experience. And, and you know, I think it's really imperative that we, again, we, we, we understand different perspectives on these things. And for those of us who are mothers, you know, when we bring our children to these spaces, how, you know, what kind of things do we have to tell them? You know, I remember taking my daughter to see, to the Lincoln Memorial as a Dakota child. You know, my teachings to her were very different than, um, another another mother's might have been because of her particular relationship to that person and that specific history is tied to our community and what my grandparents taught me. And so thinking about you know these spaces for our children and how those teachings are different depending on where we're from and what our distinct histories um, have been is really, really important. And also thinking about the ways in which so many of these monuments are so rooted in violence and the ways in which I really, you know, we can teach about resilience through difficult histories, but we should also be able just to teach about the beauty of who we are in our cultures without it always being rooted in violence, because there is a much longer history of us as indigenous people in these lands that we have to remember too. And it's it's really important. You know, I mean, everything that we're talking about here is is important. But this idea of what it means to us as Indigenous mothers to be raising children in a world that is not and has not kind of been designed for the children that we're raising. And you know, Dr. Bean, with what you're saying about showing one of your daughters, you know, the Lincoln Memorial and you know, Dr. Spears Rico, the stories that you'll be able to tell your daughter about what happened when the statue came down, those are really important. And those are, those are really relevant because this idea of education is so much broader than I think some people might expect because, you know, we all work as scholars, as public historians and things like that. But this idea of how we situate ourselves not only as scholars, not only as public historians, but how can we, as you've both done so already, this idea of humanizing and complicating these issues. And, you know, as I was listening to you both talk, I was thinking about what it's like for my sons and what it's like, you know, to teach uh, my older son a couple months ago, back when there was still football, you know, he saw, the former nickname of the Washington football team and asked me what it meant. And, you know, in, in that moment, I had to stop and think, this, like, this is something I have to actually explain to my child. And, you know, these are obviously much broader conversations than what, what we have time for here. But this idea of where we place ourselves as indigenous scholars and women and mothers is I think a really critical component of these conversations. And I believe um, Dr. Spears Rico, you have something that you're going to share with us before we get to the the names, correct? Yes. Um, so another intervention that I make um, in these um, with with public events is that I also respond artistically. And so, and so I'm gonna share um, a poem and it's called A Poem to the Fibers. Insignificant pieces of yarn, plies, fibers, thin strands, and, uh, thin strands of hemp, linen, cotton, jute, straw, rayon, sisal, polypropylene strings, nylon wraps, polyester twists, tightly woven and twined into braids that pull, drag, move, hang. 1862, Mankato, crowds gathered to witness rope, string around the necks of Dakota men, 
who refused to abandon their homeland, a violent surreptitiously sanctioned spectacle signed into law by a man who vowed to free slaves. In Tulsa, six decades later, descendants of the enslaved freed by that man would be hung by different rope, flowering into strange fruit harvested from the branches of Southern trees. Crowds gathered to sneer, drag, pull, and tie the news of thin strands of hemp, linen, cotton, jute, straw, rayon, sisal, polypropylene strings, nylon wraps, polyester twists, insignificant pieces of yarn, fibers, pies, tightly woven and twined into braids that murdered with the master's tool. Today, black fists and brown hands use that same tool of insignificant strands of hemp, linen, cotton, jute, straw to uproot monuments to the violent acts that hung, pillaged, and raped their ancestors. Take this strand, I tell you, hold the braid of it between your thick fingers. The bulk might burn your skin as you tug and bend your knees as you might sprain an ankle or a muscle if you pull from your back, but haul we must for the laws of physics instruct that all the fibers together, pulled by all these people together, will create the force we need to tear them down. And remember, we are not like them. We are not taking down men. We are pulling these brick and mortar replicas from their pedestal so they can stop laughing at our pain. Ready, one, two, three, heave and then breathe, dear child. Today the master's tool did dismantle, did dismantle this ma master's statue. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. And it really, I think, exemplifies what it means for us to be in so many different places and to fill as many spaces and places as, as we can. And so now we're going to move into our question and answer period. And we have, we've had a number of questions coming in and we likely won't have time to get to all of the questions, but we will we'll do the best that we can. And so the first question we have is from Maeve Kane, who asks, what do Dr. Bean and Dr. Spears Rico think should be priorities in thinking about what comes next or how to replace the monuments that are coming down? Well, I think we have to really think about who is at the table when we have these conversations um, and really um, think about how can these spaces be more reflective of our society today? Um, whose voices need to be there? And how are these spaces are also viewed for the eye, through the eyes of our children? Um, you know, there, 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 there are, at this point, I often wonder, you know, how much more do we really need to put up? How much more do we really need to create? At the same time, there are certain, um, times in history and, and people in history that need to be memorialized and remembered. And it's imperative that we do that and to do it in a way that brings people together and doesn't cause more division. You know, so how do we, how do we do that? It's, it's, these are diff difficult conversations, um, but there has to be room for all of us if we're all going to live here. Um, within Dakota territory, you know, this is, this is Dakota land. Um, and Dakota people need to be a part of these conversations of what happens in our land. Yes. Um, I'm not sure also that we need more monuments. I know that there was a related question on the board about that. Um, I think, uh, you know, when people ask me, do you think that um, taking down these monuments is erasing history? I disagree as a professor because I teach from these archives. I teach the diary of Christopher Columbus. I teach, I teach Bartolome de las Casas. It's important to, you know, keep those in the archives, you know, store the monuments in the museums um, so that we can continue to interact with them. I'm not so sure that we need them, you know, in public spaces um, when they are causing hurt. Um, to communities and are seen as, you know, some of our community member members have called them symbols as of genocide, you know. Um, that's, um, that's that, that I think that these conversations need to be ongoing um, so that we can continue to talk across the table from these different perspectives, um, but also, you know, to hear, you know, how um, how these uh, how these how these can be triggering um, to our community members and do cause cause pain. 
I would add too that a, you know a lot of artists that are that are very artists and historians who are very interested in some of these topics don't necessarily want to see all monuments destroyed. You know, by any means. Um, you know, I think that there there are conversations with conservation of what that means of where things go um, when it comes to you know where what do we put up um, if you need if, if if we're going to really contextualize history in a way that is equitable, are we going to be able to do that with another plaque? You know, are we going to be able, it, it needs to be on the same scale, the same size as the monument. And I think that that creates some, um, some difficulties when we talk about space as well. And, you know, I, I think this idea of, of space and place is, is really important. And I mean, again, that's part of, you know, what we're thinking about in terms of, of this entire series. And another question that we've got, um, sorry, give me one second. I had it. So Jennifer Olson Arbogast um, asked if you could talk about the dignity statue in South Dakota and just kind of, you know, do you have any, any thoughts about that? How do you see that fitting into this conversation if it fits at all? Well, I think it's interesting to think about, you know, there's a lot of different um, examples out there and the Minnesota Historical Study is going to be sharing a lot of these different examples of, um, you know, public artworks to to remember history and to, to honor people. Um, I think what's interesting about the Dignity, Dignity statue, which is very beautiful, it's a very beautiful, for those who don't know, it's a, a statue of a, of, a, of a Native woman dancing. Um, and a lot of people in our community really love to go and view that statue. Um, it's quite large. Um, and it, it, I think in a lot of ways it's amazing, but at the same time, it wasn't a native artist that created it. And we have to think about in these public spaces, it's not only thinking about the past and remembering the past, but supporting our communities today, supporting our community of artists today, um, especially right now, our artists are struggling and we should be supporting them. Um, and, uh, you know, that statue wasn't a Native artist. I don't have anything to add to that, so. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bean. So we, we have a, a, couple, a couple more questions coming in. And one from Wesley Bollinger is, kind of both a, a question and, and a comment, asking if the members on the panel can give advice on how to ask community members in the correct manner. Uh, you know, bearing in mind that a lot of times community members can get overwhelmed with having to almost act as representatives for an entire demographic. So how, how can people ask these questions? How can they kind of move these conversations forward while also acknowledging that that creates more labor for members of underrepresented populations? Well, you know, public engagement, you have to go to where people are at. You know, don't expect people to come to us. And I think we've seen that over the years um, in the ways in which we've been kept out of process um, and the ways in which we haven't been engaged with in appropriate ways. Um, the CAT board is currently putting together two task forces through the Lieutenant Governor's Office. And one of those task forces will look at public engagement around some of these issues specific to the Capitol. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see how that work gets done. But for those of us who, who um, do any sort of work with public engagement, you know, there is there's a lot of different elements of, of public engagement with tribal people. There is the citizen tribal engagement with um, community members who live in reservations, with community members who live off reservation for community members that live in the suburbs. But then there's also the official tribal um, nation to nation relationship and making sure to, to have that engagement with tribal leaders and tribal council, councils is incredibly important as well. Um, and, you know, at, at the Minnesota Historical Society, we work with a lot of tribal historic preservation officers. Um, and, you know, I work for an institution that's made up a lot of mistakes in the past. And as director of Native American Initiatives, you know, I work for an institution that was founded um, to exclude my people from this state's narrative in a lot of ways, um, very pointedly so. And so, 
um, you know, our work is very much focused on, on better engage, trying to create better engagement practices. We make mistakes. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, but you need to engage with people, but you need to go to where people are at. You need to not expect them to come to you. Absolutely. I would, um, definitely agree with that. I think, you know, um, getting informed, um, you know, being culturally confident and getting informed on how to approach those particular communities, depending, you know, are what on what their protocols are, if it's, you know, going through um, asking, you know, an elder. And by the way, an elder was consulted also before the um, Columbus, you know, statue came down in, in St. Paul um, or and or, you know, contacting, you know, um, the institutions that we do have from these communities. Like I know that, you know, we don't we also get um, questions on protocol in American Indian studies at the U of M. And um, we if we ourselves, you know, um, can address those questions as a department or we can consult with the communities that we're connected that we're connected to as well. So, um, you know, that's, it's, it's a, it's an important, important question to take into account. And it is because it can absolutely be overwhelming. I've also been seeing it with, you know, the Black Lives Matter um, movement of, you know, just exhaustion, if it's the same people over and over again, um, that continue to, you know, be at the forefront on the front lines addressing, you know, um, speaking as, as was posed in the question, um, speaking um, as a representative of that particular community. And in while while we're talking about you know local communities and not only their their role in in these conversations but also just kind of thinking about this historically, Deb Peterson asked if local Minnesota tribes have any history of creating monuments to history or is that something more connected to other cultures and how do you have a sense of how local Native tribes might feel about erecting monuments to people from Native history? I think if you ask five different people from our community that question, you'll probably get five different answers, you know, and that's the other piece to it is there are multiple perspectives in our communities. Um, you know, an, an example of that is, you know, talking about the legacy of naming um, and, you know, thinking about um, do we honor place names with the names of people, particularly men in communities, or do we, uh, in Dakota language, we are, our names for places are more often um, descriptives of places. Um, but at the same time, over time, our people, you know, have named tribal colleges after people. We have memorialized people in our history as well. Even if historically, traditionally, we didn't do that, that has become a newer tradition. Um, and so those are complicated um, questions to ask for sure. But there, you know, it is really interesting to learn the ways in which our communities have um, sort of changed some of those practices over time, too. I can speak to it from a different, you know, cultural and um, and country context. In Michoacan, we actually have um, statues to Purépechas. We have one, for example, in um, in the city of Morelia, which is the capital city. We have a statue of um, three Native women, and it's called Las Tarascas. Um, and I don't know actually how much those statues have benefited, you know, indigenous people. Um, oftentimes, you know, they're used, you know, for selfies and, you know, or, or to, you know, take pictures in front of them or whatnot. Um, they become emblems of, of, uh, of the state itself that then get exported through as images through tourism at, you know, another, another reason to visit the state. And then they just become sort of um, absorbed or appropriated as cultural symbols that don't really serve a political purpose for the communities themselves. So, you know, so I'm not so sure. The other thing that I will say is that we have our monuments, you know, we have um, our, you know, mountains and um, our rivers and, you know, um, oceans and places that we care about. I feel like those are monuments to Indigenous people that, you know, I would, I would consider rerouting, you know, that funding to conserving those monuments, you know, like in Michoacan, for example, we have the Yacatas, which are traditional pyramid structures um, in different communities. And, you know, I, I, we need to advocate for those, you know, quote unquote monuments to also be around for the future generations. And that's what matters, I think, in Indigenous history, too. I think that's incredibly important what you just stated there. You know, our when we think about our, our stories that are tied to these places and these, these natural landmarks that um, for us tell our history, 
um, place names that tell our history. I think it's incredibly important to think about that um, and, and to look at the ways in which we can, we can conserve and preserve some of these spaces, but also thinking about the ways in which, you know, if you look at Mount Rushmore, um, and what has happened with with that space and the way that 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 our communities think about um, about that space and don't feel welcome there and don't feel represented um, and what we would like to see happen with that space as community members is is you know we we need to have these conversations and it's it's just really like like you both said it's just really important to like you said, go to where the people are and have these conversations and to recognize that monuments can be so much more than a statue on a pedestal. And just just a note for everyone who's watching, uh, we are at an hour, but if you'd like to stick around, we do have two more questions that I'm going to pose to our panelists. Uh, we understand if you need to leave, this will of course be archived if you want to come back to this conversation later. And so our second to last question is from David Bliss, who asks if the Minnesota Historical Society has any formal relationships with any tribal or native community archives and museums. We do, um, you know, the Native Americans in Initiatives Department, um, which, which I lead is, you know, and my colleagues within my department work very hard to um, make sure and to advocate for our communities within the institution. You know, MNH is a very large institution, and um, and that's what's interesting about the work. But yes, we do work with tribal leaders. We also work quite a bit with tribal historic preservation officers. I just spent the morning on the phone with with one of my colleagues there, um, and not again, not saying that we historically have always done this right. And in fact, I think that historically we did it wrong. Um, I know that. And um, that's part of the reason that we are here today um, in trying to create a, um, trying to repair that relationship and to build a more sustainable um, way of doing things that is more inclusive um, to change the way that we're doing things. Um, that's something that we're working very hard at. And there are a number of different things we're working on in the Native American Initiatives Department. Um, and you can always reach out to me at kate.bean at mnhs.org. I will probably regret that I just gave my email out, but it's fine. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there's a number of things we're working on that, that um, can speak to that. Thank you, Dr. Bean. Um, we'll, we'll see if you regret that decision or not. Well, time will tell. <laughs> And so our, our last question uh, is one that I'm actually really intrigued by. Uh, Chantel Clay asks, are there any examples of public monuments that accurately and equitably showcase history? And are there any that are local? There are, you know, I think that when we look at, um, and later on in this series, we're gonna be, um, we're gonna be talking to some public artists um, and looking at the ways in which there are certain memorials to um, Dakota people throughout the state, um, like the one down at the Fort, at Fort Snelling State Park, um, the, the memorial there, um, the Wokiksuye um, that the Owen family put together um, with a pipestone plaque that honors the Dakota people who died at the concentration camp below Fort Snelling. Um, my grandfather was one of those who died at that space. And so there are examples of working with community and of um, working together to remember certain histories and spaces and, and people uh, throughout the state. And what it is, is it's a collaborative approach. Uh, and that's incredibly important to think about. And so I, like I said, we ran over just a little bit, but I wanna thank both of you so much for taking the time to talk with us today and to answer these questions that we've gotten from people who've been tuning in, whether they've been on Facebook or YouTube. And I want to thank everyone again, who's behind the scenes, who helped us plan and put all of this together. And we honestly, we couldn't have done it without them because I definitely couldn't have figured this out on my own. And we also hope that you will join us next month 
Our next event will be August 20th at 3 p.m. and we'll be expanding the conversation to also look at Confederate monuments. And one of the panelists will be Dr. Melanie Adams, who's the director of the Smithsonian Anacostia Community Museum. We hope to see you there. Miigwech. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Okay. Uh